Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is on the introduction to the Prodigy Plus given by mm -hmm. Annie Alveda, our product line manager. We will be taking questions throughout the presentation, so feel free to submit them and we will address them at the end. Okay, I'm handing it over to you, Manny. Okay, thanks, Shelley. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the time out to attend this webinar. Um, the subject is going to be the new ITP system that we have, the Prodigy Plus. And let's just let's start the presentation. Um, Teleline Lehman Labs um, has been manufacturing ITPs for, a pro for about 30 years. Um, we've been manufacturing ITPs as long as anybody else. Uh, we were the first to use the shell optics in a commercial spectrometer. Um, our first instruments were all PMT based, but we knew the benefits of the shell optical system um, as applied to ITP. So we have never made any other systems except the shell based systems. Uh, we were the first to introduce the benchtop ICP, the first to introduce the, a large programmable array detector, which we call the LPAD, which was on our previous generation of ICP, the Prodigy family. And we were the, were the first to introduce a CMOS-based um, detector technology for ICP, which will be part of this presentation. Um, Prodigy Plus is our eighth generation of ICP. We have them listed there, starting with the plasma spec in 1982 and going through all the way through the Prodigy Plus, which is just introduced um, earlier this year. So here is the Prodigy Plus. Um, it's based on the Prodigy ITP, so externally it's, it's very similar in design. Um, we've made a couple of changes to it. Uh, one, we've, into, we've taken the best of what was on our Prodigy 7 ITP, and that's the CMOS detector, along with the um, plug and play of the twist lock torch design. So two major changes um, and we'll take a look at some of the other features um, of the instrument. Okay. So the Prodigy Plus is going to, it combines the CMOS detector with the outstanding Prodigy optical system. It was always one of the strengths of the Prodigy ITP was the, the image quality and stability of the optical system. Um, we added a sort of a twist lock torch design which is a demountable um, basically plug and play on the Prodigy 7. We've um, made some modifications and added that to the Prodigy Plus. And we also retained one feature of the Prodigy and that was its ability to perform halogen um, determinations on it. So we'll look at each of these. Uh, the halogens just um, in light detail we sort of we plan to give a webinar on the halogen capability um, in the future. Okay. So the features that we'll look at on the Prodigy Plus, we'll look at the optical system, the detector, the CMOS detector, the demountable, the low flow torch or the plug and play torch, and a look at the halogen capability. Um, first is the optical system. Okay. Um, so the Prodigy Plus optical system is the same as we've used on the Prodigy system. Um, it's an 800 millimeter focal length system. Um, features that are important are the ones that are highlighted in red. And we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, focal length is 800 millimeters. Um, one other feature is a property called dispersion, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, which is a feature of the shell optical system, um, which we take advantage by using the large detector that we have. And we'll talk about that in some detail. Um, and also the wavelength range. Prodigy Plus wavelength range, the standard wavelength range is 165 to 1100 nanometers. Um, it's a pretty wide range. And if the instrument is equipped with the halogen option, that'll extend the low at the short wavelength range of the instrument down to about 134 nanometers, where all the halogen um, lines up for chlorine and bromine um, primarily. Okay. And we talked about, um, mentioned dispersion. Um, we all, everybody knows what resolution is, and resolution is basically the peak width at half height, or basically how wide the peaks are. Another property is what's called dispersion, and that's a, a measure of the linear spread between the peaks at the detector. And that's one of the advantages of using a shell spectrometer. It has outstanding resolution and dispersion, um, far greater than what used to be called conventional systems. systems um, based on PMTs with uh, 
sequentials and simultaneous systems uh, simply don't have the dispersion to match with what the shell spectrometer can do. Um, just for an example, um, this is a three meter system and we compare the dispersion of the shell on the Prodigy Plus which was about 0.19 millimeters per millimeter. Again, that's the spread of uh, between wavelengths on the detector. Uh, a system that was almost a little bit more than nine feet long does not have, a conventional system does not have as good a dispersion as an shell spectrometer does. Um, and it was one of the reasons that Lehman Labs has always favored the shell design for ICP, so we maximized resolution and dispersion. The optical system for the Prodigy Plus um, is shown here, um, very similar to the design of the Prodigy. First is we have a, con a computer controlled source mirror. This mirror is what selects the axial, radial, and halogen views. Um, um, elements can be put in any of these views um, depending on the concentration. One other feature of that mirror is it allows the operator to optimize the viewing position in all the views. So you can select an element in the axial, radial, and halogen view and have the mirror optimized to give the highest intensity. We also use um, special mirrors. Uh, one of the features of the instrument is its image quality, which we'll look at in a, in a bit. Um, and one way to maintain good image quality, and by that we mean resolution across the detector, is to use what are called toroidal mirrors. Um, these are designed to have very few um, aberrations and maximize light throughput. We use a dual pass prism, meaning we go through the prism in the go into the grating and from the grating, um, and that allows us to maximize light throughput and gives us good resolution. The entire optical system is heated to about 32 or 33 degrees. Um, for long-term optical stability. The casting um, is made of is an aluminum casting, weighs about 65, 70 pounds, so it's a very good thermal mass and maintains um, its temperature, um, does not change temperature very easily, um, so enhancing long-term stability. And the entire system ha is a very low outgas system, um, and that's to give us the very good UV performance, which is necessary to be able to determine halogens and also to reduce the amount of purge gas flow that's needed to keep the system purged. Um, the typical purge for this unit is about 0.7 liters a minute, which is, actually, which is quite low and is designed to operate off the bleed of the liquid argon tank that people normally use. So we're going to talk a little bit about image quality and show the advantage of this type of an optical system. Because these the detectors that are used, um, solid state detectors, be the CCD, CID, or CMOS are flat. So it's important that the spectrometer be able to have a flat field focus um, so that we don't have poor image quality off the edges of the chip. And when you do with the optical, if the image quality is not very good, then as you move away from the center of the chip, the resolution degrades. So to be able to determine that, um, it's good to look at some several locations on the chip to make sure that the resolution has not degraded. Um, and this is one reason it's also um, the image quality. You can't just take a large detector and drop it into any optical system um, because it's a function of the focal length. So it's not the, just by taking a, a larger detector does not automatically give you better image quality. In fact, it can be worse on a spectrometer that's not designed from the beginning to run that way. So having a smaller detector can also result in what are called inter-order overlaps, um, and we're going to show you some of the advantages using the Prodigy Plus optical system um, there. Okay. So one, if we look at the resolution across the detector, this is what you see on the screen. This is what's called the full frame image of the mercury lamp. You can see um, primarily up in the in the visible, and there are two circles there. Those are the same wave wavelength off the mercury lamp in two different in two different optical orders located very far apart on the chip. If we take and zoom into those, we can see that the resolution of that mercury lamp on those two orders is virtually identical, um, meaning that we have a very good flat field of focus across, across the detector. Right? And this is sort of a bit of a schematic. Generally, the longer the focal length, all things being equal, the more 
the better the image quality is because the focal the focal length is, or the focal is it's actually curved. So we consider it like having a like a ping pong ball on the table or a beach ball. The ping pong ball doesn't touch as much of the table. That would be like the shorter focal length. So and as you move to the edges of the detector, you're out of focus and consequently that degrades resolution. A longer focal length system maintains resolution over the in the, the width of the of the detector. Okay. If we look at theoretical measured resolution versus theoretical resolution on the Prodigy Plus instrument, you can see that as we move across the chip, and the chip is roughly um, 27,000 microns across, you can see that the resolution is actually quite flat, degrades a little bit um, on, on one side of the detector. If we look at the same type of data from shorter focal length systems, it's obvious that the, the image quality suffers as you go away from the center of the chip. Resolution is generally reported as a wavelength at 200 nanometers. 200 nanometers is generally located in the very center of the chip, and as you move away from that, the resolution degrades. And that means, in some cases, a particular wavelength can't be used um, in certain matrices because it's actually become um, too wide. You now start to have interfering element um, problems and requires the use of a different um, a different wavelength to be able to to get the analysis done. Right. The overall challenge of designing a system with a detector for Nichelle spectrometers, you'd really like to be able to fit the entire Nichelle spectrum on the detector at one time. And that doesn't and you want to do that so you don't compromise the qual the inherent qualities of the Nichelle spectrometer, which is resolution and dispersion, how much the wavelength is spread at the detector in a relatively small package, right? So you can have a detector that, uh, a small detector on a low dispersion system, which isn't very useful. Um, you'd have to make the slits very short. Um, otherwise, um, there's too much inter-order overlap, but the short slits reduce the amount of light. Detection limits will be very poor, um, and there'll be all sorts of inter-order overlap. So that's not a, not a good approach. By using a smaller detector on a high dispersion system is possible to do, but requires the instrument be able to take multiple measurements. So you do a measurement at long wavelength and a measurement at short wavelength. So there are some wavelengths you know, shown in the schematic there that are circled that won't fit on the detector um, because as you move this back and back and forth, they will not hit the detector. The the way to, the best way to do it is, in our view is the approach that we've taken to use a very use a large detector um, on a high dispersion system and that allows us to use one reading to get the wavelengths all the way from 165 up to 1100 nanometers um, at one time one integration um, and if you have a dual view system at two integrations one for the axial one for the radial instrument. Um, this is an example of what we call a full frame image, um, and hopefully it comes through. Um, sometimes um, on these webinars, some of the detail gets lost, but you should be able to see each one of those lines going across as an optical order. And what we'll talk about now is the advantage of the large detector is actually the spacing in between the orders. You would like that to be as large as possible, um, and we'll look at some information as to why that's the case. So if we look at a large detector means there's going to be more spaces between the orders. And we look on the right hand side is an image from a detect uh, system that doesn't have as large of interorder spacing. And you can see the peak there that's shown or the, the white rectangle is actually a silicon line that's located just above the lead, uh, what's called subarray there. And a little bit of that signal from the silicon leaks into the leaks into the subarray and it's red as lead. If we look at the Prodigy Plus, um, there's no um, silicon peak there because uh, it's a different instrument, won't exactly have the same um, elements above the lead line. But the point is the inter-order spacing is much greater. Um, that subarray for lead, which is this rectangle here, is approximately um, it's uh, five pixels high. So you can see the interorder spacing is approximately 10 pixels there. So that's a that's a very wide um, space, so that it's, you do not get 
light from one optical order leaking down into, into another optical order. A ex similar example, except this is copper on the, um, the lead 220 line. Again, on the system with the smaller interorder spacing, you can see that it does reach into the subarray a little bit. We're on the Prodigy Plus, or on the Prodigy, this is a function of the optical system. Um, you can see the interorder spacing is much greater, uh, and that line, and it is another cop, it is a copper line that we show there, does not spill or um, travel down across that interorder spacing and cause the lead line to have a problem. Right? Right, and the lead, the instrument will re will report this as lead because it'll be light that that gets into the subarray, and that's what the large interorder spacing prevents. Another example, um, down at the shorter the wavelength that you operate at, the greater the interorder spacing is going to be, which is what you want. Uh, the ITP spectrum is much more complex at short wavelengths than at long wavelengths. So in this case, the selenium line um, is very close to the two silicon lines that are located there. Um, the interorder spacing there is almost 15 pixels wide. Be virtually impossible for anything to be high enough concentration so that it would bleed down into that. Um, so that that is the the reason why we've chosen to go with a very large detector, the largest that's available, um, so that we can maintain this property of the Echelle spectrometer, um, which is the the resolution and the dispersion, and that helps with to operate. Um, and run samples in complicated matrices or in matrices where some elements are present at very high concentration compared to some others. Um, the data that's on the screen there is from a, an application note that we'll be publishing soon um, using co um, coal fly ash with the Prodigy Plus. If you look on the right hand side, the elements that are highlighted in red were done on the radial view. These are the really high concentration elements. Um, you can see most of those are in percent level. And if we look at, say, for example, silicon there is present at 21 at 21 percent in the sample itself. The solution presented to the instrument was about 400 ppm because it's roughly 0 0.2 to uh, 0.2 grams of material dissolved to 100, mil, uh, 100 mils. So you can see even with these very high concentrations of other elements that are present at percent level, we're able to analyze um, a number of elements on the axial view um, with very good accuracy. We're not really seeing any of these high concentration elements causing any problems with um, spilling over from the, um, the interorder overlap problem um, that you would see on systems that don't quite have the um, the interorder spacing. And also to keep in mind too, when you actually run the analysis, when you're running in the axial view, the wavelengths of the light from those elements are still hitting the detector, which really increases the amount of intensity that you get when you're not in the radial view. Um, so the instrument is, is able to, to handle the very large amount of light without causing any um, interorder interferences. And you can also notice, too, that the, um, the elements that are in the radial view are, are across the spectrum um, as, as low as the iron line at 259 all the way up to the potassium line at 766. Um, generally, in the radial view, more than just sodium and potassium are done. In fact, very infrequently, are just sodium, only sodium and potassium done. Most applications that require dual view will require a number of elements to be done, both for um, to deal with very high concentrations or to deal with the in, um, easily ionized element effect that affect elements like sodium, potassium, lithium, and such. The um, move on to the, we'll talk about the, the CMOS detector. Okay. First, what is CMOS? The CMOS is a complementary metal oxide semiconductor. Um, right now, these have a significant share of the commercial sensor market, and they are appearing in consumer devices now um, with great frequency. And after a fair amount of time and research, um, CMOS devices now have performance levels which equal or exceed either the CCD or the CID technologies that have been used for the past 20 years or so. Why did we choose CMOS? Um, for a few reasons. One, very 
this very high level of flexibility, so it allowed us to customize this detector for ICP. Um, we worked with uh, another a Teledyne sister company called Teledyne Scientific and Imaging. Um, they design um, images, and we worked with them to come up with an imager that was really customized for use for ICP OES. Um, CMOS also has a lot of on-chip circuitry that can do some of the, more of the processing functions, and that increases the speed, and we'll see some examples of that. Um, what we also wanted on the CMOS um, is features that we had on the LPAD, or the CID detector that we use, and those are random access integration, um, so that allows us to be able to read certain areas of the chip so we didn't have to read the entire chip or read a certain section of the chip. We can read any individual piece of the chip. Uh, Non-destructive readouts allows us to prevent blooming and to be able to run everything at the highest signal to background ratio. And by doing um, the non, what we call non-destructive reads, that reduces noise. Anytime you make a measurement with a, CI, with a solid state detector, there is some amount of noise associated with each read. The more readings you do, the smaller that noise component is. And the LPAD had that capability. And going forward, we wanted to maintain the random access integration and the non-destructive readout capability, which we thought were the, the most beneficial features of the, L, of the LPAD that we were using. Okay. Um, this is the detector designed exclusively for uh, Lehman ICPs based on CMOS technology. It has the same size as the LPAD, roughly 28 by 28 uh, millimeters, which makes it about four times the area of, of other devices being used. Uh, one difference is we went with a much smaller pixel size. Um, research and testing showed that for us the ideal size for what we wanted to do was, was 15 microns. Um, the LPAD had a, had a 27 micron. And for that size device with that size of a pixel um, translates into about 3.38 million pixels um, on the device. Okay. Um, major difference is the CMOS detector has a much faster readout time than the LPAD. It's a more modern device, um, and the design, uh, the way the pixels are designed, and we'll see that in a, in a, in a few minutes, um, allow the device to operate at a much higher clock speed. Um, and that translates into much faster analysis times. It takes less than a second to read out, read out the device. Um, it's pretty, pretty independent of the number of wavelengths or the number of elements um, that are in the method. Um, it generally takes a second or less to read all that out. Um, we went with USB communication, Simplify. Um, it, it's a faster way. The uh, LPAD was Ethernet, and the Ethernet um, could cause some made uh, networking sometimes um, a bit more difficult because of the two network cards that were required. And the firmware is designed um, by Teledyne Scientific and Imaging, and um, that allows us uh, to have control of any firmware or any design changes that we might want to um, employ at some point. Okay. This is uh, just a, what the detector looks like mounted in the camera. You can see um, the detector, the 28 by 28 millimeters. Um, it is Lumage encoding to give us a better performance in the, in the short wavelength uh, UV range. Um, the two um, Connections on the bottom are for the three-stage Peltier cooler that's used to chill the detector down, and the little um, other connection there is for the incoming argon um, that purges the detector, prevent any condensation from building up. Yeah. And here is just to show the um, detector mounted on the optical system. You can see this is the, the 800 millimeter optical system. You can see how, how thick the casting is. It really is a uh, a massive optical system for long-term stability. Here's the USB connection, the, the cooling water, and there's just one one board. The LPAD had a, had a number of boards. Um, one was the computer to run it. Um, this particular um, device is what's called a field programmable gate array. So it, it doesn't really ha it doesn't have like a Pentium or anything anything on it. So it boots up much faster um, than the LPAD did. The LPAD was essentially like booting up a, a laptop um, would take some uh, a bit of time. Um, the CMOS detector boots up essentially instantaneously. 
Okay. We compare the detector with the L pad. Um, the size is about the same. We have more. There are more pixels. The pixel size is 15 by 15, as opposed to the 27 by 27. Um, one other difference is what's called full well capacity, um, and that's a measure of how much light or how much charge each pixel can be um, can hold, and that definitely that affects the dynamic range of the system. Um, even though the absolute number is smaller than the L pad, it's because of the um, pixel size is smaller. The the number of pixel, uh, the number of electrons per unit area is actually higher, so it can it has greater full well capacity. Um, the preamp is helps with the it, the processing of the data. The L pad had one preamp per column. The CMOS has a preamp per pixel, which translates into a lot more speed. Um, and one other feature of the CMOS devices is the the noise per read. They are much much quieter than the L pad or a CID detector, um, approximately by a factor of 10 with a single read. Um, there are both the LPAD and the CMOS device don't take single reads. We all take mul multiple reads, but the CMOS starts off with a much lower no uh, read noise, and we'll see some of the effects of that in a bit. And the overall readout speed is about 40 times faster. It reads out at 2 megahertz as opposed to 0 0.05, and that translates into the data coming off each run coming off much faster time. So just uh, what some of the some of these features and what the benefits the 28 by 28 gives us the better dispersion and that large into order spacing that we saw the smaller pixel size helps us define peaks better full well capacity gives us much better a much wider dynamic range and much wider linear range I'll show you some data in the in the next slide or next couple of slides the preamp um, per pixel translates into much into much faster readout. Um, this lower noise per read um, allows us to actually operate this detector at a higher operating temperature than the L pad, and we'll see that in a bit. And the data readout speed <clears throat> gives us simply a much faster readout, and we'll we'll see some data about that. This is a comparison between the pixels um, drawn roughly to scale. On the left hand side, the L pad pixel has a lot of the electronic components are sort of in the pixel and that cuts down on some of the active area. Um, where on the CMOS pixel, all the pixel electronics are located in the upper right-hand corner under that um, green rectangle, and the electrodes for the readouts are also over on the right-hand side, so there's not a, lot of, not a lot of, there's no electronics inside the area of the pixel. It's, it's all surface or all photoactive area, which helps increase that full well capacity. Because of the speed, the linear ranges, and these are linear ranges determined for method 200.7, the CMOS device shows an improvement. Um, this is just so, some data, but it showed improvement across all the elements um, that you would measure by 200.7 by factors of, of you know, 10 and 20, um, simply because of the faster speed. The detector has a faster clock speed and can monitor what is going on which each, each of the pixels at a much faster rate, so it's much easier to prevent the pixels or pixels from approaching saturation. So that's one one ex one advantage of the greater speed of the instrument. Another is the is the read noise. I um, compared the read noise of the L pad, which you see in the green, with the read noise of the CMOS device, which is in the red. Um, it, it's a, it's just the CMOS device is just simply a just much quieter device um, elect electro electronically, and that will allow us to raise the operating temperature um, of the device. It doesn't have to be have to be run as cold without any penalty and detection limit. If you run a C a solid state device at high temperature, your dark currents and your um, detection limits degrade substantially. So that's why they all operate um, at relatively low temperature. This device being much quieter allows us to run it at higher temperature. Okay, um, just an idea of what the read noise is on this on the L pad. A single read, one single read is about 300 electrons, but we don't do that. the The L pad would figure out how many would change the number of non-destructive reads based on the concentrations, uh, based on the intensities. 
So if we did 256, we could get that down to about 18 or 19 re, uh, electron noise. The CMOS device reads much faster. Um, it looks at every pixel in every subarray that you're running. Um, it looks at that pixel every 0.015 seconds. So in a 30 second integration, you get roughly 2,000 uh, non-destructive reads, and that takes that 30 electron noise down to less than one. So it's a, it's a much quieter device, and we take advantage of that by, rate, by not having it run the temperature um, so low. Okay. And then the data transfer time, uh, comparing it to the LPAD, um, as you add wavelengths to the LPAD, the amount of time taken to download the data um, could become noticeable, especially when you we're up in the 30, 40, or 50 wavelength range, which a lot of people do. Um, that could add another 20 or 30 seconds per reading for each analysis. Where with the CMOS device, because of the two, because of the per pixel preamp, and because of the two megahertz readout speed, the amount of data transferred um, or the time for the data to be transferred generally does, regardless of the number of wavelengths, um, does not really increase very much. It's all let. It's less than a second. Okay. Right. So the advantages that you get there is the lower read noise allows the camera to be run at higher temperature. Um, we're going to run the CMOS at roughly minus 30 as opposed to the minus 40. And it, and what's good there is the thermoelectric coolers or the Peltier chillers don't need to work as hard to maintain at 30 minus 30 as opposed to to minus 40. The data transfer speed improves sample throughput. Um, the CMOS does not require a pre-shot, so that saves a couple of seconds on each integration. Um, adding additional elements of wavelengths don't have any effect on the readout time. It's fast enough to, to maintain that to be less than a second. So for this, the analysis time is really going to be determined by your integration time and sample uptake and rinse. So that's you know a true low cost of analysis, a combination of how of the speed in of the of argon consumption. Um, it's not simply just a, a system that has low argon consumption. It has to have the speed to, to be able to keep the sample throughput up. Okay. So the um, and let's get that one. All right. Then we'll move on to the the twist lock torch. Okay. All right. So we introduced the twist uh, twist lock torch with the Prodigy 7 um, and really it's designed to eliminate operator variability from, from the sample introduction. Most of the problems that people run into with ITP starts in the sample introduction area um, and from you know dealing with pump tubing, nebulizers, um, people trying to put different operators putting the torch back in in different positions. So the twist lock sample introduction system was designed to eliminate that variability. So it's, it's supposed to be easy to remove from the instrument. Um, it is, it just twists out. We'll see some photos of that. But it also has an automatic positioning of the torch. So once the position in the coil is set, either axial or radial, um, an operator can take it out and get it back in the exact same spot. Um, there's an adjustment scale for different sample types. So if you have aqueous or organic or high levels of dissolved solids, there's a, there's a numerical scale that can be used, and we'll see photos of that. It automatically makes the connection of the coolant and the auxiliary gases, um, so there's no mistakes. Can't plug the coolant into the auxiliary and the auxiliary into the coolant line. There's no torch arms to break trying to get the Tigon tubing off, um, and there's no need to check the leaks. Every, it's a pretty um, robust connection. The coolant flow in the instrument on this torch range anywhere from 12 to 20 liters a minute. Um, there are various sample injectors available, different bores. Typical for aqueous work, people use 2.5. For organics, they use uh, 1.5 or 1. And it's also available with a ceramic injector for hydrofluoric acid samples. So for the, on the Prodigy Plus, um, we, we returned to the 20 millimeter diameter, which is what we used on the Prodigy in the past, and we that should increase the lifetime of these torches. And there are fewer parts on it, um, so it's a bit e it's a bit easier to use, and it uses color coded O-rings to eliminate um, any confusion as to where the O-rings. So if we look on the right hand side is what we had on the Prodigy Seven, 
and similar except that there's this um, sort of sleeve and two O-rings that go um, that go on the torch. Um, for the Prodigy Plus, what we did was we incorporated that into this cylinder so that there's O-rings on the inside. They're shown here. These two blue O-rings on the that are shown on the torch. Those are actually inside that piece that um, screws down over the the base of the torch. There's also some O-rings here. The blue O-ring is designed to go on the bottom, slightly different size, um, so, the, so to eliminate the confusion that maybe with the other O-rings that were close in size but not exactly the same. So going with the Prodigy Plus, um, that is what we've going ahead with. And if you do if you do operate a Prodigy Seven, um, there is a path to upgrade to this newer torch design, um, which which can be done um, actually pretty easily. And sort of here's another close up of the Prodigy um, Plus torch design here. Um, there's another O-ring which is on the inside in here, um, which keeps the injector um, centered in the coil. Um, sort of a, a shot of the of the sample introduction system. This is a dual view system. Here you can see the axial torch with this mirror for, to get the radial view. Right. Sort of a close up of how the dual view operates. We have a, a small a mirror here that looks just above the torch. There's the axial view, the radial view, and that um, source mirror that we talked about earlier is used to direct the light from the appropriate view, axial or radial, onto the entrance slit of the of the spectrometer. Okay. So a close up of the of the positioning scale. This this allows the operator to set by setting this cylinder with the scale, the torch turn this part of the torch we we'll see in a minute twists out and the next time it goes in its position is determined by the position of this cylinder that's uh, with the scale that's on it. So what that does is depending on how you set the scale controls the depth of the torch into the work into the RF coil um, on the axial and on the radial. It's more, much far more critical on the radial as you're looking across the torch rather than through it. Um, it shows some data on the, um, the reproducibility of the of the torch placement. Okay, so to take the torch out, there's um, or, or to move the what we call the cylinder. There's a locking lever. Once that lever is moved, this cylinder can be moved in and out to determine the the depth that the torch will sit in the in the coil or the height it'll sit in the coil for for a radial system. Right. To remove the torch, we just grip that. Grip the the bottom of the. This is an Altem. Um, we grip that, twist it counter counterclockwise, and once it's been twisted, it can be removed, and then the torch can be removed from the system. And then when it's placed back in, it's the reverse. But the position of this cylinder, depending on where you set it, is what determines the location. Uh, determines the position of the torch. So it's a nice it's a nice feature, particularly if there's lots of different operators, three two shifts or three shifts, um, and not all the uh, not all operators have the same skill level. This will allow anybody to take the torch out and put it back in and have it be in the exact same position. Um, this uh, the data here. It's sort of is an example of the torch, the twist lock torch, um, being able to reposition it um, was actually done on a radial system with kerosene. Um, running some wear metals and, and oil. This is a check standard. So after the last check standard was run, that's the one that says first run, um, the instrument was shut off and then we came back the next day, took, took the torch out, disassembled it, put it back in, turned the instrument on, warmed up for 15 minutes, and then re-ran that check standard. And you can see the recovery between the two systems is actually, is, is actually quite good. So um, being able to pull that torch out and put it back in um, it wor works really, really works very well um, for the positioning, so that every operator can put that torch back in the the exact same spot that it was when it was taken out. Okay. 
And then the last portion is we'll look uh, at the halogen option um, just briefly. Um, so halogens by ITP, ITPs operate, tend to operate in the, from the, depending on the system, from about 160, maybe up to 8 or 900. Um, the, I, the Prodigy Plus covers 165 to 1100. The best wavelengths for halogens are in the 130 to 150 range or so, actually 154 or so, a little bit higher. So well outside the normal operating range. There are some halogen lines in the at long wavelength, but the sensitivity is, is poor um, and generally not good enough for, for, for any work um, that people want to do, especially at lower levels of chlorine. So to be able to do halogens, it requires a special setup in there. Um, and the Prodigy Plus, we have an add-on option uh, to be able to do that, similar that we had on the Prodigy. So here's an overview of the way, the way we approach that. So we have the main body of the spectrometer of the optical system on the bottom. And what we do is we mount a a second detector, so basically it's a spectrometer within the spectrometer to be able to access the wavelength range between 134 and 154 is actually where it, where it winds up falling. So um, if we look at the optical system from the side, the torch is over on the right-hand side off the screen. So the light comes in, hits the source mirror that we that we've talked about previously and directs it through a different slit and then there's a, a grating which is hung from the t hung from the on the top of the spectrometer that directs the light to another mirror and then that mirror directs the light up into the what we call the, the deep blue or the or the halogen camera which is a um, CCD array uh, linear array close up of the of the camera setup so the light comes in, hits a mirror, and then goes up into the in, into the halogen camera. So the halogen is treated as another view. So we have a, an axial view on a dual view system. We have an axial view, a radial view, and a halogen view. Okay. The camera, the detail, it's a the linear CCD with the lumogen coating on it, 28, 2048 pixels on it. <clears throat> um, does have a TE cooler, though we actually operate these pretty much at um, at room temperature. And it's a uh, we can see the explosion in the back of the data acquisition, and it's also a, a USB connection to the to the spectrometer. And then just an example, <clears throat> using a different program, uh, what we use for alignment, and everything, showing the halogen spectrum down um, from about 134. We have a bunch of the chlorine lines, and then on the other end of the detector, uh, the bromine lines at about 154, 155 um, nanometers. <clears throat> so that's um, so that's just a brief introduction to the halogens. Again, like I said, we will do a another webinar focusing solely on the halogens um, at some point, probably early next year. We're coming up on the end of this year. And then finally, so just <clears throat> so in summary, so. The way we look at the Prodigy Plus as, be, as taking the best features of the <clears throat> instruments that we that we've had, um, we took the pro, the optics and um, halogen capability from the Prodigy and added the CMOS detector and the torch um, design, the twist lock torch design from the Prodigy Seven to continue with the with the with the Prodigy line. Um, the new uh, new system, and we we have great hopes for it. Um, and that brings us um, to the end. If anybody has any questions, we'll be 